Good morning. We welcome you to our service here at South Fork, and we know that there aren't very many here in the building today, but we know that we have many of you who are tuned in on Facebook this morning, and we really appreciate that. And we hope that you will join us in our worship today. You may think that we don't have, you know, we, we may be thinking of all the things we are um, missing this holiday season of Thanksgiving, but we have so much to be thankful for. And we're going to start this morning and sing a couple of old hymns about Thanksgiving. We're going to be singing, Come Ye Thankful People, Come, and then For the Beauty of the Earth. And just remember, God has given us all of these blessings, and we need to be thankful. Let's sing together. This morning I want to uh, include in our prayer words of Paul, prayerful words uh, that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Rome. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our suffering, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts 
through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Lord God and Father, we come to you this morning hopeful and yet challenged. We have those in our church family who, who've suffered loss. We lift up Kathy and her family and Bridget and her family and ask for comfort for them and encouragement. We have others who are struggling with impacts from the virus. We pray for health and recovery and safety and hope. Father, every time I think of South Fork, I'm, I'm filled with hope. I'm thankful because I see the resilience that is here and the and the endurance, the perseverance, but most of all, the faithfulness. Faithfulness to, to you, to your mission, to the mission that you've given us. I was thinking this morning of an event in 1806. Five guys took refuge from rain in a haystack. And from that simple prayer meeting in a haystack, thousands of missionaries went out across the globe. Oh, Father, South Fork's out of haystacks, but we've got cornfields. And so I pray that as we, as we lean in to the challenge before us, that through us that what, what Satan means to hinder and to stop and to harm, that you would bring good, that you would bring a, a miracle for your kingdom. We lift up every one of our South Fork family. And I pray that as we walk through the challenges before us, that each one of us would grow stronger, more faithful, more hopeful, that as a church body, our vitality would, would blossom. that your kingdom would be honored, would be blessed. Father, we lift up, we offer our time of worship this morning. May it glorify you. May it honor you. May we increasingly Respond to the spirit within us that you have placed there, that you have given us strength and hope and purpose. I lift up Dave as he brings the message this morning, a message of thanksgiving. in the midst of a season of, of unusual thanksgivings, thanksgivings that don't rely, can't rely on many of our cultural traditions, but yet may very well be distilled into the purity of thanksgiving. A thankfulness to you 
for your incredible blessings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
want to thank everybody for tuning in, whether you're doing it with us on Sunday morning uh, or whether you're watching it later on uh, during the week on YouTube. You know, I know that there's a lot more people going to be listening uh, to this sermon and watching it uh, than who are actually here today uh, to be a part of it. So uh, I'm just wondering if, as you're listening to this, how many of you are beach lovers? How many beach lovers do we have who are listening today? If you are, I'm going to invite you to close your eyes. Now, if you're at home and really comfy, you might want to keep them open because I don't want you to fall asleep. But uh, if you're a beach lover, just kind of close your eyes and imagine that you're walking along this tropical beach somewhere. There's a warm summer breeze. The sun is glistening off of the waves. And you're getting used to that rolling of the tide coming in and just kind of hitting your legs and then drawing back out to the sea. And you're feeling just very, very relaxed to the point where you even stop for a second. And you close your eyes just to take it all in. When all of a sudden, wham, out of no place, there's this rogue wave that comes and knocks you off of your feet. And the next thing you know is you're scrambling and splashing around. And the person next to you lifts you up as you're trying to get the seawater out of your mouth and out of your nose. Now, for many of us, that may be what life has been like these last few weeks and months as we've been living in a pandemic. We just get used to some new reality. We get comfortable with it when all of a sudden there's this another wave that hits us. Maybe somebody gets sick in our family or maybe something else happens and we just have to adapt. You know, as Ron mentioned in his prayer, there were two families this past week who lost loved ones. Kathy lost her stepfather and Bridget lost her mother and losing a relative, especially a parent during normal times is challenging enough. But to do so when you can't even be with your loved one, when they're dying, taking their last breath, but having to stay at home and wait for that phone call, I think is just excruciating. So I appreciate Ron's prayer, and I do ask you to continue to pray uh, for those two ladies in our congregation, as well as anyone else that you know who may be wrestling uh, with illness or struggling financially or anything else during these times. And please, please. Remember to pray for those healthcare workers who are literally get, getting hit wave after wave after wave. I'm not really sure, I, I was thinking about this week, I'm not sure how people without faith can even survive something like this. But we are thankful that we have a God who is in heaven who pours out his love and mercy into our lives each and every day. We spent the last three weeks talking about kernels of thanksgiving. And we've talked about Psalm chapter 103, verses 1 through 5, where David lists some of the benefits that God has given to us. We handed out, we made available little packets of corn with a little tag on it that I've encouraged people to put wherever you eat most often. And before you take that first bite of a meal, that you just remember to thank God for something that you feel he's given to you on that day. I don't know about you, but maintaining an attitude of gratitude during these times has really been a challenge. And so I'm glad that we've committed to making it a month of Thanksgiving and not just a single day. But with this day and this week, Thanksgiving holiday is actually going to happen. And I'm going to encourage you to, before you take that first bite of the feast, that you go around the table and Ask everyone to just name something that they are thankful for. And then after you've done that, then you can work on your turkey coma, okay? Because uh, I know that that's what's going to happen is everybody's going to eat too much turkey and then you're going to sleep the rest of the day and that's fine. But what I want you to do too is I want you to listen to the things that people share when they say what they're thankful for. And my guess is that probably our kernel of Thanksgiving that we're going to look at today just may be one of those top things that are mentioned. Each week I've read a different version of Psalm chapter 103, and today I want to read from the New King James Version, okay? I thought about reading the Old King James Version, but there were too many these and thou's in it, and I just kept stumbling, and so I'm going to go with the more modern version today. So this is going to be the New King James Version of Psalm 103. Sounds very familiar uh, to a lot of the other versions that we've looked at as well, but you can read along with me as we look at the first five verses. Verse 1, bless the Lord, O my soul, 
all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. And then he lists, who forgives all of your iniquities, who heals all of your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Today we're going to look at that second part of verse 4 where it talks about he crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. Other translations translate those words love and mercy or love and compassion or steadfast love and mercy. And the word crown is talking more about surrounding us. And it's a picture that David's painting for us of God surrounding us with his love and compassion so that wherever we are and whatever we're going through, he's there with us. So I do hope, if you feel like you're being beaten by these waves these last few weeks and months, that you've still been able to feel and at least to know that God loves you. If you're having a hard time doing that, then perhaps today's topic is just the right topic. And what I want to do is look at some of the unique qualities of God's love. And by doing so, hopefully we'll be comforted and assured that no matter what's happening out there, no matter what's happening in this world, that God still loves us. And the first quality that I want to look at about God's love this morning is its fidelity. The fidelity of God's love. You know, fidelity isn't a word that we use a lot nowadays. Instead, we'll substitute the word faithfulness. But, what, you know, I was, I'm old enough and many of you are old enough to remember too when that word faithfulness was talked about in the relationship between a husband and a wife. I remember conversations not even long ago where the topic was marital infidelity. And as a result of that marital infidelity, those marriages ended in divorce. Here's something that we can count on about God, and that is that he's never going to cheat on us. And even if we cheat on him, he's still going to be 100% faithful to us because he has such a stubborn love. Have you ever thought about how much fun it would have been to be an Old Testament prophet? I mean, to be given a message from God, and your whole job was to deliver that message either to God's people or to some nation who had done something to the Israelites. It would have been fun, I think, to be Elijah, to be on Mount Carmel with those prophets of Baal and be able to mock their gods by saying, hey, maybe he can't hear you because he's in the bathroom. <laughs> one of my favorite passages in Scripture. But then to be able to know that when you call down lightning from heaven, that it's going to come, and it destroys not only the sacrifices, but the altars themselves. How much fun would that have been to be Elijah? Wouldn't have been as much fun to be Hosea. <laughs> Hosea's message was about the fidelity of God. It's a story in the Old Testament where God told Hosea to marry a prostitute by the name of Gomer. Has anybody ever known someone named Gomer? I haven't. And you know what? I think just marrying somebody with that name would have been a challenge. But then when you add the fact that she was a prostitute... You know, going into the relationship, Hosea knew that Gomer was probably not going to be faithful, and surely enough, she wasn't. He married her, she gave him a child, and then she went back to working the night shift. And God said, Hosea, I want you to go redeem Gomer. We talked about redemption last week, but he had to go and buy her back, which he did. The whole idea of what God wanted Hosea to demonstrate was how Hosea was going to be faithful to Gomer regardless of her fidelity or infidelity to him. Just showing a picture of how God is to all of us. And that no matter what we do, even when we don't love him, he still loves us. In my years in ministry, I've had more than a few occasions where there's been a husband or a wife who have 
been unfaithful to their husband or to their spouse. I remember such a case in Connecticut where it was actually the wife who cheated on her husband, and when he found out about it, he was absolutely devastated. Shortly after finding out that news, he came over to our house, and I asked him this question. I said, do you still love your wife? He said, yeah, I do. And then I asked the question, do you still want her to be your wife? And he had to think about that one for quite a while. But then he said, yes, I do. And based on that answer, then it took a lot of years and a lot of counseling and a lot of work. They had to work through a lot of underlying issues and problems. But I'm happy to say that to this day, they are still married because of the stubborn love of that man. And you know, as stubborn as his, as his love was, God's love is just even more stubborn. And that he doesn't just give up on us, he's waiting for us to come back. He's the father in the story of the lost son who is looking down the road to see if his son is coming home. And when he sees his son, he's the one who takes off running towards us. And he greets us and he welcomes us no matter what we've done. That's how stubborn God's love is. Paul talked a little bit that there's nothing that can separate us from that in Romans chapter 8 and verse 38. Paul said, I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all of creation, even including pandemics, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Sometimes when we're being hit by waves in life, I think one of the best things that we can do is to remember that God still loves us and that he's not going anyplace. So this, this, this week, as you're celebrating Thanksgiving and maybe you're talking about things that different people are thankful for, just see if someone doesn't say, how thankful they are for God's love because his love is always faithful. His fidelity is perfect to all of us. But you know what? I hope that as we're thinking about that, we're also remembering the mercy that's in God's love. To really understand the biblical uh, idea of mercy, I think we have to understand a little bit about a Hebrew word called chesed. It's the word in, in verse 4 that's translated loving kindness, steadfast love, or just love, which tells me that as different translators looked at this Hebrew word in this context in David, they really didn't know what to do with it. So perhaps one of the best things that we can do as we try to understand this word and this concept of mercy is to get a core understanding and then illustrate it. At its core, it simply means to bend down. Imagine that there's a young child who's on the floor and he's upset and maybe he's hurt and he's just crying and, and very, very upset and you bend down to pick up that child and provide him comfort. When you do that, you're being merciful. There's something about mercy that we have to remember and that is that there's always an action involved with it. Mercy isn't just a thought. It's not an idea. There's an action that accompanies that thought. An act of mercy that I think we oftentimes overlook can be found in Genesis chapter 12 and that's the story where uh, Abram and Sarai are just about to enter Egypt. Now, Sarah must have been a smoking hot, gorgeous babe, okay? Abram got really lucky there because he knew that the moment that Pharaoh saw her or learned about her, that he was going to want to take her to be his own wife. And so she asked, he asked Sarai to extend him an act of mercy. And what he asked her to do was to lie about her being his wife and instead say that she was his sister, and that's what she did. And if you know the story, they had to work things out, and it took a little while for God to make everything okay, but it ended up Abram left the country even richer than he was when he came in. 
Have you ever thought about Sarai's decision there? If she wanted to harm her husband, and if she wanted to be selfish, she would have withheld that act of mercy, and she could have become probably one of the wives of Pharaoh. But it would have cost her husband his life, and she loved him too much to do that. God's love for us is filled with mercy. And we know that there was that great act that demonstrated that mercy and that love more than anything else. Paul alludes to it in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. He says, as he's talking about God's love and mercy, he says, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, bending down to us, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. Because it's by grace that you have been saved. God's mercy and grace just go hand in hand. So when Jesus bent down from heaven and that sole act of dying on the cross, he gave us that gift that we couldn't earn or that we couldn't deserve, that, light, that gift of new life. So as we think about reasons for thanksgiving, and especially for those who are followers of Christ, there's little question why oftentimes we'll say that we're thankful for God's love but then we'll also say that we're thankful for his mercy and the grace that he's shown to us through Jesus Christ. So again, here's a little challenge for you. Sit around the table on Thursday or Friday whenever you celebrate the holiday. And if you go around the table and you ask people to, to share things that they're thankful for, see if someone doesn't say God's love. And then see if someone else doesn't say God's grace or his mercy that is so full of God's love. The fidelity and mercy of God's love is really enough to stretch our little finite brains if we want to think about it enough. And just the time we think we begin to understand God's love, what we do is we discover that there's something else that we've never thought about. Ever realize that? Think about God's love long enough, and there's going to be something new that's going to come as a result of those thoughts. And the third unique quality that I want to share with you today about God's love is that it is more than we can comprehend. God's love is more than we can comprehend. There's a prayer of the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 3 that talks about God's love that I've always found fascinating. Because it talks about his compassion and his love. Look with me at Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16. Two parts of Paul's prayer here. The first part says this, I pray that out of his glorious riches he might strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That's a great prayer in itself. But look at the second part. I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all of the saints, this is his prayer, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ but to know that this love surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all fullness of God. What I find fascinating about this prayer and really intriguing is that Paul says that we are already rooted and established in this love, but then he prays that we will grasp something that we can't understand fully. It's beyond human comprehension to understand God's love. I think that's why back in Psalm 103, David used two different words to, to, describe, to try to describe this love of God. The first one we've already talked about, which is that unchanging love of God, and that's something we think about, isn't it? We can think about God's unchanging love. But the second word that he uses there has more to do with the heart and emotion and feelings. Compassion is something that we feel feel more than we think about. And sometimes when the waves knock us off our, off, our, off our feet, we don't think about God's love. We just feel God's love. And so that's what I'm praying is that those of you who are struggling, that you feel God's love. You may not be able to even explain it, why you have such peace and why you're so comfortable with everything else that's going on. The reason is because God has bent down, he's picked you up, 
and you feel His love. For those of us who tend to think more than we feel, it's a challenge to focus on feeling love and not just thinking about it. So I, I challenge us to just stop what we're doing, all the stuff this holiday season, and allow ourselves to feel love. We may know that we're loved, but so many times we need to feel that we're loved. I can tell my wife Sharon a dozen times that I love her, but she'll tell you that she feels it the most when I just wrap my arms around her, stop what I'm doing, and just hold her for a few moments. It's usually then that the tears <laughs> start rolling. Perhaps what we need to do this Thanksgiving is to allow God to just wrap his arms around us and just hold us. If we do that, then you know what? There's going to be this natural flowing of thanksgiving that we may not experience otherwise. Sometimes we need to position ourselves to be hugged by God. We need to just open our arms and let God wrap his arms around us. And I don't know what works best for you in order for that to happen. You know what? What I have to do is slow down. I just have to take a break and think about God's love and allow him to embrace me. In addition to Psalm 103, there's another psalm that I think helps position ourselves to be able to feel that love. It's Psalm 136. It's a responsive psalm, meaning that a leader says a line and then a crowd or the congregation would respond with a, a phrase. And I want to do that today, okay? I, I want to read most of Psalm 136. And um, it's going to be kind of a challenge because most of you are at home alone. But you know what? I'm going to encourage you, no matter where you're at, to just vocalize these words with me. In fact, let's just practice them now. Say with me. His love endures forever. Say it again. His love endures forever. You know what? There's a whole list of things in Psalm chapter 136 that we're going to read. And I'm going to try to read them. And I want us to feel this love that endures forever this morning and not just think about it. And so I want you to say his love endures forever, not just monotone and just repetitively, you know, each time. But say it with feeling and emotion so that you can feel his love. Let's practice, okay, before we get to the part that I really want to focus on this morning. There's three verses that talk about God's faithfulness to the Israelites that I'm not going to include in, in my closing this morning, but I do want us to practice with them. So look at them with me, if you would, okay? To him who struck down the firstborn of Egypt, so go ahead, love him, and brought Israel out from among them, To him who divided the Red Sea asunder. Okay, you know what? I think you've got it. Those of you who are at home on the screen is going to appear the part that I'm going to say. And then I just want you to say with feeling and emotion that his love truly does endure forever. And hopefully by the time we get through this passage, you're going to feel that love, not just think about that love. So let's walk through Psalm chapter 136. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Give thanks to the God of gods. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. To him alone, who alone does great wonders. Who by his understanding made the heavens. Who spread out the earth upon the waters. Who made the great lights. The sun to govern the day. The moon and stars to govern the night. To the one who remembered us in our low estate. And freed us from our enemies. And who gives us food and gives food to every creature. 
give thanks to the God of heaven. His love endures forever. May we not just think about God's love, but may we feel it. As we think about what he's done for us, his faithfulness to us, that act of mercy that Jesus Christ gave to us. I'm going to invite our worship team to come and to prepare us for a time whereby we're going to remember that act of mercy, Jesus dying on the cross, and then we'll be able to share together in the Lord's Supper. John 3.16 states perfectly the love that God has for his believers. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. I was thinking about the disciple John this week and was reminded how Jesus felt about him and how he entrusted the care of his mother to John while hanging on the cross. What love is shown Listen as I read this event to you from John 19, verses 25 to 27. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that time on, the disciple took her into his home. As we think upon that, as I think upon this, as Jesus being fully God and fully man, and how he had such great love for his mother. We're going to partake together, communion, at this time. First, the bread, which represents his body that was broken for us. And then the cup, which represents his blood that was spilt for us. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for your one and only Son, Jesus 
who went to the cross for our sins. Thank you for the many ways that Jesus showed his love, being fully man and fully God. Help us to walk closely with you this week. We love you, Lord. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Again, thank you so much uh, for joining with us today uh, online or anytime during the week. Um, we sure do miss being able to have people in the auditorium and uh, be a part of our service, but thank God for the technology uh, that is available. This week, uh, we're going to wrap up our uh, collection from the community of the Operation Christmas Child Boxes and uh, take those to Mason City tomorrow to a regional area. And so uh, on behalf of Tracy and all of the other workers here, thank you so much for all of the work that you've done uh, as a part of that initiative here, uh, this holiday tradition really uh, at South Fork. Thank you uh, for doing that. Also, um, thank you for your faithfulness of sending in your tithes and offerings, uh, allowing us to continue our ministry support of people all around the globe so that they can hear the gospel. Uh, we encourage you to continue to do that, and we thank you uh, very, very much for that. So uh, for the foreseeable future, uh, we're going to be primarily online, and uh, we welcome you to join us either on Sunday mornings or later on if you want to watch it on YouTube but just thank you uh, for being a part of our church. If there's anything that we can do for you, uh, feel free to contact one of the elders or contact the church office or myself, and we'll be glad to get back with you and do whatever we can uh, to help you through these times uh, if you're being hit by all of these waves. So um, have a great week. Have a great Thanksgiving. I pray uh, that it will be a time where you can just enjoy what family are able to come and uh, enjoy time just reflecting on God's goodness to you. So we're going to close with one more song uh, this morning that talks about singing of the mercies of God's love. So I'll have the team come back and to do that and uh, pray that you uh, have that great week that we hope you have. <laughs>